Sir, I am afraid I am not in a position to support the resolution which has been moved by my friend. I am not opposing this resolution because I am unmindful of the large number of abuses that exist in the corporate sector or I am less enthusiastic myself in seeing that these abuses should be removed as early as possible. But the method that he has suggested is so dilatory and the problem before us is so acute that no useful purpose will be served by appointing one more commission to investigate into the working of the corporate sector when we have got enough data and to my mind we have already got enough statutory powers to see that these abuses are checked and if possible completely eliminated. I do not see what this commission can do whether it can throw more light on the malpractices that are rampant in the corporate sector. We all know that any commission that deals with the particular problems of a particular industrial concern gives ample evidence of the fact that malpractices exist in the corporate sector and the government is aware of it. I was one of the members of the Joint Select Committee on the Company Law Amendment Bill 1998 which ultimately became the Company Law Amendment Act 2000 and in that committee also enough evidence was brought forward to show that malpractices existed in the corporate sector and certain salutary amendments in the company law were made. In spite of these amendments and in spite of the original Companies Act, we do find that abuses still persist and the question before us is how to deal with the abuses rather than investigate further into the nature of the abuses and the extent of the abuses. To my mind, the real remedy for us is not that of appointing commissions and committees and thereby postpone the solution of an urgent problem but to deal with the problem here and now with the agency which is at our disposal. This agency is the Department of Company Law Administration which is working under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry of the Government of India. This agency has again and again, year after year, in its reports complained that they have not got enough personnel to deal with the large responsibilities that have been placed on them. It is this lacuna in our administrative machinery, it is this weakness in the agency which is called upon to see that the company law becomes a fit instrument for checking and eliminating the defects in the working of the corporate sector which is mainly responsible for the persistence of abuses. The real solution of the problem before us is to strengthen the administration to enlarge its power to enlarge its scope of inquiry and above all for the government to take prompt and effective measures against abuses which have been pointed out by the company law administration. Mere incorporation of the abuses in the report is not enough. It is necessary for the government to act and I would be happy to know what action the government has so far taken against the specific abuses that have been pointed out in the report. If these abuses to which the attention of the government is drawn in the report remain unpunished or had not received the attention of the government to the extent it deserves, there is likelihood of the impression gathering in the public mind that the government is not serious in enforcing this law and root out evils which this law is called upon to root out. It is in this connection that we have painfully to draw your attention again and again to the possible connections that might exist between large units in the corporate sector on the one hand and the government machinery on the other. There is an impression in the public mind that influence in right quarters is an absolute minimum necessary in order to get things done and it is this which is responsible for the concentration of economic power in the corporate sector. The other day, the Prime Minister made a statement in the other house dealing with this problem and pointed out that an elaborate machinery exists to deal with the problem of licensing that 
इट इज़ द पॉलिसी ऑफ द गवर्नमेंट दैट लाइसेंसेस आर ओनली गिवन अकॉर्डिंग टू द मेरिट्स एंड द नीड्स ऑफ द सिचुएशन एंड दैट वेन देर आर नो कंपेलिंग रीजन्स देर इज ऑलवेज प्रेफरेंस गिवन टू न्यू एंड ट्रेंड्स एंड न्यू एंटरप्रन्योर्स दो द कंपनी लॉ एग्जिस्ट दो इट इनकॉर्पोरेट incorporates certain very salutary provisions though an enforcement machinery exists and though the machinery has tried its level best i must say to administer the law as it is because of administrative difficulties because of political considerations to which the government has not given its full attention the purpose for which the act was passed by parliament and the money is voted by parliament is not fulfilled in the first place so far as this resolution is concerned it has been worded in such a way that it is likely to lead to results other than desirable and he has put in certain expressions which call for very strong remarks in the first place may i point out here as some honorable members have rightly pointed out that this question raises two points one is whether he has found any flaws in the government rules regulations or executive orders now all these orders are before parliament we have got the government servants conduct rules we have got rules relating to disciplinary matters we have got rules for safeguarding the national security and we have got certain other rules dealing with the filling of petitions or appeals so far as the wording in all these rules is concerned my friend or rather our friends opposite have not pointed out any single defect or any expression that is likely to be misused under the circumstances sir i fail to see any necessity for scrutinizing all these rules because they have stood the test of time and the omission by my honorable friends to point out any particular defect or any expressions of a sweeping nature is itself some evidence to show that the wording of these rules regulations and executive orders is proper is unexceptionable i shall deal with this aspect later on again the next question that arises is whether there are actions taken by the executive by not interpreting interpreting the rules properly or by abusing the rules for the purpose of what they call victimization or discrimination so far as this question is concerned some honorable members have given a few instances in their own way and my honorable friend suggested that the facts have been given by him they are not the facts they are his coloring of certain happenings had the honorable members given me all the instances wherever they found them in which there was any attempt at victimization or a discrimination certainly i would have been in a better position to effectively answer all those points all the same may i point out that in this connection we have to be careful i could have understood the honorable mover's speech a vehement speech before the general elections when his party was in the happy position of being members of the opposition here or elsewhere it is not merely a question of opposition but they have also to consider that whatever they say here whatever action is taken by perhaps the misguided members of their own party will have repercussions of an absolutely undesirable character so far as even that state is concerned that is the reason why i would request my honorable friend to note if he is prepared to accept my advice that whatever he says against the congress party has its own repercussions in the first place upon his party members because naturally there are bound to be over zealous members of his party secondly you and i and all of us have to understand that party affiliations or party feelings should not interfere with the loyalty or the allegiance of our government servants be they in the kerala state or in the rest of india because certain principles have to be accepted when you are going to govern a particular state then naturally you have to be careful what is happening today might be convenient 
might be proper, might be expedient from a particular point of view, but it will recoil upon the heads of these people later on. That is the reason why party considerations have to be kept entirely apart from considerations of administration. May I point out here that when under the present parliamentary system of government, a government is formed, then what the party has to do is to work amongst the electorate and try to send to the parliament or the legislature as large a number of its members as possible so as to enable them to form a government. That is one function of the party. The second function of the party is to lay down board rules of policy, especially rules regarding the manner in which the interests of the country are to be advanced. So after a government has been formed by the majority of the members, that government naturally, wherever it is, to whichever party that particular ministry or cabinet or government belongs, has to take the interests of all the people into account. It is really a government by the people and of the people. Under the circumstances, we should not at the administration level bring in party considerations at all. I know, sir, that there are certain countries where this party affiliation goes even up to the administration level and to be an anti-party man is an offence against the administration. That is not our case. Here though we have certain parties, the moment a government is formed, all the people in the land are entitled to the various amenities.